and all the different, uh, Mr. Gasper was uh, a nice, very polite, just so polite, just oh, very polite. And during the war, when, or before the war started, before Roosevelt came and opened that dam, that said they were going broke. There was nobody had jobs. And women from the farms and girls would want to come and work for us in the hotel for nothing, just so they had a place to stay and to eat. And he said, I couldn't take people in. I couldn't feed them anymore. And he said, I told Mr. Gasper, I can't, right, I can't charge anymore. I can't do this. And Mr. Gasper said, Morris, we'll go down together. Now imagine. He said, I don't, don't quit me. Dad didn't, he couldn't charge anymore. It was just terrible. When Roosevelt did that, Dad said, guys that come in the bar, said the New Deal. Yeah, when he started this dam, started the, they can, do you have a shovel? If you've got a shovel, I can go to work tomorrow. And anything, any that, and the deal was, they hired anybody that would come. You didn't have to work, they didn't have the equipment. All they wanted was them ready to get them ready to go. But these men were starving to death, had nothing for their families. They didn't want to go there and do nothing. So they would go take their own shovel and work to hell they could get them the right equipment and stuff. They were working for just to, to make, just to have a job. But the fear of losing the job was so bad that they, they couldn't take it unless they had, that said they took anything to go to shovel or anything and go down. Well, Dad just loved Roosevelt. He said he was, they were going broke, they had nothing. He saved the country, whatever he did or whoever likes him or not. But from the time I was a kid, when he got in, uh, they, he was always, it was always Roosevelt. He was, uh, how many times was he president? Four or something like that. I mean, he was a long time. When uh, something happened to Roosevelt, it scared me. Because, oh, oh boy, Roosevelt, I mean, somebody like Trump would have come along and, <laughs> for me at that that age would have scared me to death because Roosevelt was very poised and things like presidents should be. You know, whether he was a good president or not, I don't know, but he was very, he carried it off and he looked good and we were all proud of him, you know. And that was a, yeah, just different things that dad, oh, dad loved Roosevelt. He, he thought he was just it and my grandmother didn't like Roosevelt. So it was a tough deal, but we go down to Cumberson, they live in Cumberson. Grandma and Pat didn't like Roosevelt. And uh, she, they were, isn't that funny how everybody's different, you know, but Grandma's strong about it, but she was quiet. And she didn't want to hear anything about Roosevelt. So they got to know that she did some things you don't talk about in the family, you know. So that would have been your mother's parents? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was well, their last name? It was my mother's mother, my, my mother's uh, father ran a saloon in Cupboardson. At that time there were 13 saloons in that little town. It was a railroad town. And they must have uh, that's where his, her father, her grandfather would have been I guess, uh, came there. He was working for the railroad there, Irish. He'd been in in fact he was with um, Custer. Yeah. Uh huh, and he, they, he went with Reno, where none of us would be here. <laughs> and he came in, he would tell Uncle Jack, mother's uncle would tell what his dad saw. It was terrible. They had mutilated all these people. And but uh, we went down there and we couldn't find the name at all. It was Shields. His name was Shields. And my mother's maiden name was Stevens. And there's a Stevens, I think, up at uh, Scobie and around that owns a lot of stuff. That was the brother, it was his brother. There were several Stevens. They had that Footprints in the Valley, if you've ever read it. Some woman wrote in there, she said, oh, those Stevens brothers, they were a bunch of wild ones. Well, that one would have been my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> but they was down in Cumberson. And he had a good friend, ran the bar next door. And he divorced his wife, and he got to drinking and raising cane. And my grandfather came into his place, and he said, "No, and you've had enough. And just go home now." He took a gun out and shot and killed him. So my mom was just three, four years old. She never knew her father, and that was her stepfather, then mm -hmm. Pat Gould, 
was a, he was a highway patrolman actually. He was a border patrolman here. And he used to uh, border, you know, stop the, they bring liquor over from, that was his deal, I don't know what he did. But she, mother came just to visit them. She was, uh, she was going to school in Minot, I guess. It surprised me, because they never tell you these things. I read about it later. And she came to spend uh, just a couple weeks in the summer, and she met my dad, and he was running the hotel then. And uh, she was 19 years old, and they eloped. And uh, my grandfather, my, her stepfather says, Oh, she knew so many nice men. They would always laugh about it later because they did love Dad, you know. But he was uh, 14 years older than she was, you know. But ran a saloon, and maybe that attracted her because her father had died in the saloon business. I don't know. But he was a really good-looking guy and carried himself well, you know. And I guess that he liked the look of her. And they, uh, they ran off and got married. It's kind of funny, but. Uh, Spent a lot of years. She worked right beside him, and she was his best, best friend. Never, he said, when he came home at night, he didn't have to argue with her. You know, she met him, and she worked right there beside him. And and I never ever saw him have an argument, ever. Only time I ever saw trouble is I came out into the lobby, and they were talking. My mother was crying, and my dad said, "But I've got to." He wanted to go to the army. And boy, he wanted to go, but he wasn't going to speed. And she said, but I can't run the hotel without you. Whoa, Mildred, we we're called upon to do a lot of things in our life. But this one, you've got to buckle up now, and you're going to have to do this. And she was about five foot tall, just cute, sweet looking. Morris, I can't do that. You can't go, oh, we all got to give up things. We've got to do it. Well, I think he was 44 or 45, you know, too late to... August Ancelite went, and he was dad's age, and August uh, was in the Seabees. Well, August had a little problems as time went on, but dad stand up for him like crazy because uh, August went to war and he didn't. And dad was in charge of the American Legion. Well, the Fourth of July was coming, and he had to be in charge of the parade. He was in charge of the rodeo. He was in charge of everything that was going on, and he working himself to death to get this thing ready to go and run the bar. So August's job was to get the band for the dance that night. Dances were very important in those days. They would stop for a noon at, for, at midnight for dinner, and you know have a nice meals, and everybody came to the dance. So. Dad got all dressed up to ten, get into ten bar, and here come everybody from the dance. They they don't come till after eleven thirty or so. Here they come. The dance just got started. So what's the matter? He said, "Oh, we can't dance." He said, "August hired a one man band, <laughs> and one guy, you know, <laughs> pumping the drum and then blowing the bottle organ and." <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't imagine all these guys wait for these dances and they get down there and they got one guy, one man band. Well, Dad said we had to hustle around and get a couple old ladies out of bed and stuff to play the piano and somebody to play the fiddle and they went on with the dance. But I always thought that was the funniest story. He said, get down there, you're all ready to go. And here's a one man band, one guy giving everything he got, but it wasn't getting the job done. And I thought that was so funny. Oh. But I don't know if I told good stories or history, enough history, but uh, the teachers that would come to town, all the different teachers, and you have a lot of them, oh, their big complaint in life was the water. Always they were mad, you know. Every, I can remember they lived in the hotel and they'd rent a room and there wasn't anybody who wasn't about half mad about the water all the time. And they, but they hired a lot of young teachers. And it was not the most desirable place, I imagine, for a kid coming out of college, you're going to end up here, you know. And but So they didn't get always the best teachers either, but uh, they were a big part of the community, you know. And eventually they got so, they a lot of them got married, and that's the water they got the rest of their life. But it was not water anybody wanted, <laughs> yeah. I get well, the railroads, now they're talking about getting rid of the streamliners, you know, I don't know if that's still going on, but wouldn't that be awful?
you know, you got to have railroads really what made this country. They, they had this, they started Hinsdale down by Tampico. They came up here because it was closer to the source of water. So they could bring it, they had the pump house, and then that, there was a big water tower. I always saw that water tower, and, and you kid you don't even think about it. That was for the railroad. And my friend Marietta, there again, could climb up on that thing. I couldn't do it. I had a fear of heights. She was, got me in a lot of trouble, but she never got me on the top of that water tower, I'll tell you. But that was, uh, and, and a lot of the, uh, Montana Power was big around then. They brought the electricity through, and they, they had a lot of, Dad loved the Montana Power crews because they rented a lot of rooms and ate in the restaurant and, you know, it's hard to make a living that way in those little towns. Dollar and a half to single, I told you, two dollar double. Now we go down to cousins a couple hundred dollars for a room, you know. They do give you breakfast, but it isn't that big a deal. And, uh... Do you remember the old, uh, Hinsdale Phone Company? Oh, I loved it. The first place I ever talked on the phone. And they had a, the phone, the buildings right down here, that uh, boy lives in it, uh, uh, Mogan. Oh. Pete? Pete Mogan. That house was the first phone huh. building. And it was up across from the Tribune. The Tribune across. Mm -hmm. I don't know who lives there now. They're from out of town. Yeah. It should be Tuttle's. And that little house is one Francine and Daniel first moved into when they moved into town, I think. That is a cute little head. It didn't even have a bathroom. It was just a small place, but it had a couple rooms. And I went over there, and I could almost tell you that woman's name. She was the phone operator, and I'd never talked on the phone. And she said, well, do you want to, Peggy? Go in the bedroom. And she had a phone in the bedroom, and she used this switchboard, you know, and she called me on the telephone, and I talked on the telephone there. We didn't even have a telephone in the hotel. Eventually, they put a public phone booth, that's where the fella glung fired. I had to throw him in there and shut that door to keep, from, keep him from running too, because he was on fire. He was burning when he got it. And, uh, but that was the, the size. We never had a phone in our apartment. And any call came, that there somebody would call us sometimes, but we didn't really use it like that. But my dad during the war would call his sisters in Seattle. And uh, he'd get a whole bunch of quarters and he was kind of dramatic too. But he'd get on the phone, you got to call the operator, and then that operator would connect you. And it would take him a half an hour or so, and he'd have that money there, and he'd be a fuss and have a cigarette. And we had a parrot, and the parrot would yell, Hello, operator! Hello! Hello, operator! And he'd carry on like that. He'd be listening to all these people on the phone. And a woman said, to, the operator said to my dad, If you will just shut up for a minute, I'm trying to get your party. <laughs> you would have to go to her and to Glasgow and then to, you know, to Seiko or wherever. It goes all over. But my dad didn't even notice the parrot where he used to. And she, the parrot told her, hello, operator. <laughs> he told, told well, if he got dad, tired of sitting on hold, he probably could just have the parrot sit there and talk he, to the operator. Well, she was right in the lobby. She's, we always kept the, the parrot in the lobby. And that was another thing. He said, Peggy. If you're in the lobby and somebody comes through there, don't you let them swear and teach the parrot, you know, see if it do it. They try to get the parrot to say a swear word. Well, that uh, was my job is to say, don't you swear and keep your fingers out and stuff. But everybody liked to talk to them, and most people were pretty good. Other people would try to pick at them, you know. But my brother would whisper, go to hell, and quiet. And you know that parrot did that. He started to do it, but he just whispered. Well, people couldn't understand it, but I could. I knew what he was saying, and he whispered that. Who would ever think? And with my brother, he said, what are we going to name him? And all I'm thinking of all these wonderful names. My brother said, Bill. And I said, Bill? And that stuck. You couldn't. My brother would keep calling him Bill all the time, you know. But uh, Bill was, was, we had him for a long, long time, and... But men in those days come from the bar, they would go into the, the cafe, and they didn't swear. Men were very respectful of ladies. If the ladies were in that lobby, they just did not. That was, that, I mean, the, the most intoxicated of them.
did not. I knew, of course, knew who'd been drinking and who didn't. That wasn't, you know, I wasn't allowed near it, but I did see a couple of them, the shin kick and bites. I, that was kind of a big Saturday night deal. If I'd been sleeping and I heard it, I had to go out and take a look. And those guys were vicious. And somebody said, oh, they were probably fist fighting. I said, no, it was shin kicking. Hmm. And same bunch. I'll never not name any names, but they said that after the next day, they'd be up at the hot water wells with their legs in that hot pot up there. They just was just brittle. But it was always the same bunch of guys. And it was kind of a thing of courage to see who could take it. I mean, they had those pointed boots on, and they just till they were bloody, you know. And uh, But, oh, people loved the fights. If there was a fight that came from everywhere, yeah. Everybody wanted to see that about all went on in Hinsdale, you know, on Main Street. So I saw my share of it. <laughs> that funny? <laughs> Little kids. What is good things of history now? Do you remember the old ice ice sheds and the oh, ice machines? Oh, we had them. We had one in behind the bar. And uh, it's like the roof I mean, I got sitting on the ground. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, of course, at the bar they had, you know, they had ice pick, and they, and also he did have ice, but a lot of it he just bought from Guy Seeley, and he came around. They all, a lot of people had ice boxes. In fact, we had one in the restaurant, great big one, and they would put ice. But at that time, when I was there, it was refrigerated, but a nice big unit. I heard Donna Campbell had it, so she bought the restaurant later on, and then. Uh, uh, what did I want to tell you about the I Oh, the ice house. Dad, for some reason, had an ice house. And that little skyrocket, we had a little horse called Skyrocket. It was always out in the backyard. And if I was a kid, I'd take an ice cream cone button, Skyrocket, take it away from me. He loved ice cream. And I and he was always out there. Dad would bring him out in the summer. He wanted Monty to be a horse first person, you know, and he liked to have him. We would have uh, circuses and things, and Monty would real active. He would do the entertaining with his horse, let kids ride and everything. But uh, all that a skyrocket liked to do was take my ice cream, so I thought, well, I'm going to fix it. I could get away from him if I could run for the ice house, and that was the shingles, and you'd run up the shingles, and the horse couldn't make it up the shingles. So sometimes I'd get ice cream going and run like crazy and get up on the ice house. One day he got it, and I was disgusted. So I went back into the kitchen, and I got an ice cream cone, and I got mashed potatoes, and put it on there, and I thought, this is going to burn him. I just couldn't wait. And I went out, da 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 da, -da. And that horse just came over and grabbed my ice cream cone and ate it. He didn't even pay any attention. I guess he didn't care if it was ice cream or mashed potatoes. But that <laughs> little horse ate those mashed potatoes quick as anything. But I can remember you say the ice house. I'd run for the ice house. And everybody had an ice house, and you had this, uh, what do you call the, your potatoes down in a... The root cellar? Root cellar. Oh, everybody had a root cellar. And I hated that thing, you know, the lot of cobwebs and stuff. My mother was in the kitchen one day, and she said, Peggy, go get some uh, potatoes from the root cellar. I said, oh, I, I can't. Monty, Monty, you go too. You help her. So Monty's two years older than I was, so we would open the big thing, and then you had to go down. And so he said, you go first. And I said, no, and he made me go first. Well, of course, you know what happened. I'd be breaking through all the cobwebs and stuff, and he's ornery enough he's too older than me, two years, and he'd make me go down. And we got down in there, and there must have been a little bit of light coming in somewhere. And these potatoes had all got this thing. My God, we both looked at those. We thought, I don't know what we thought. But we come screaming up. I'd never seen such a thing before myself. I didn't know what they were. <laughs> they must not have used them for a long time. But all of these white things were all over. Oh, we were sure it was a monster of some sort. We got in there, my mother told my mother, and she said, Oh, for heaven's sakes. <laughs> it did just scare me to death. Yeah, and I wonder whatever happened to that. It was a mound, you know, that sat there in air, and they kept. And even the restaurant had, they just feel that thing of oh, vegetables. And you know, my dad loved uh, horses, so we'd have two or three horses many times out in that back. And uh, I couldn't, I wasn't a good horse person at all, but I loved to do hair, so I would 
put their hair, their mane and all, of, all that up in curlers. I had great big curlers and I put the, I'd work out there and fix it and fix it. And then they'd start banging their head around. They'd bend my curlers. I didn't like that, I know. And my dad said, going to sell a horse and he's got the guy and he went out there to show him his new horse he got. And his hair was all in curlers. My dad said, what are you doing? He couldn't imagine. <laughs> oh, shoot. It is a fun thing. Funny, funny things. You did, doesn't it? We always just stayed right around the hotel, you know. But I say it's fun for kids. We play kick the can. And we The one thing we did at old Mr. Western, Mr. Western didn't like this deal. We'd get on tractors and combines and we'd like to set up on them, you know, and steer and stuff. And he, he was good, but... He, a lot of times, if he could just get put a run on everybody, because we were all sitting on his equipment and playing, we'd play kick the can and all that sort of thing. Nobody had to do anything till you had to get home out after dinner and then get home. You can't stay out very late. What do you remember about the guy who didn't take candy out of the rifle? He would eat it. Yeah, well, I'd only heard about that. And he lived he down by Bowdoin Lane or one of those places, an old guy, and he would come into the. But wasn't it the guy that was. No. Out here in Zortman? Somewhere out around there. Yeah, can't, Dad called him, can't think of his name. But he couldn't believe it. He'd come in there to visit, and they had big uh, barrels of candy, you know, penny candy and stuff like that. And he would leave the wax paper on, wax paper wraps. And they said, no, wait. Said, what the heck? I could almost say the name. He says, you've got to take the paper off. He said, oh, no. He said, they stick to your teeth. <laughs> he, he didn't, he ate it with the wax paper on it. Those little candy, kind of like candy kisses. They'd be penny things, you know. <laughs> funny, another funny story about the little old fellows that bachelors lived alone. And he was over, he was over a Yola and Eula and Parm Goshes. And he was having dinner, and she was an excellent cook. You know how some people are really, she's a really good cook. She made raisin bread, and they were having dinner, and he kept taking them out and putting them inside his plate, and she said, what's the matter? Don't you like raisins? He said, raisins? I thought them was flies. <laughs> he was polite enough to keep eating the rest yeah, of them. Yeah, he did, he did. He just took them out. He didn't pay attention. He just took them out, and, and he still said, don't you like raisins? He said, raisins? I thought them was flies. <laughs> Yeah, that was Eula and Parm, gosh, and the cute little farm couple. And lived tight all their life, you know, careful, and she canned everything, and oh, she was a good cook. And they, about the time the war started, they retired, and they needed a car. Do you know, they couldn't get one. The only one they got was a convertible. And there was this little pot <laughs> He did, you know, make a garden. Up. He had a convertible. The last thing he wanted, but I, I'd never seen a convertible. It looked pretty sporty, and she was just a sweet little old lady, and they'd be driving around in this. That was, must have been about the time they didn't make cars, you know, and finally they got a convertible, and he was ready to buy a car. He'd never had one, and he got himself his convertible. They never put the top down, of course. Parm and Eula. And she would... Uh, she was a sweet woman. She'd bring my mother candy and things. I remember boxes of homemade candy for Christmas. And, and, and oh, my brother and I at Christmas time say, Christmas night before we said, let's open something. Nobody was working. They weren't there. And we could open one gift. So we'd peel them all. And we'd find Euless because it was heavy. <laughs> then we'd open it real careful. And we each pick out two or three kinds of candy and then wrap it all back up and put it up there. We knew right away what was Eula's candy. <laughs> Isn't that funny? She would she could make any kind of candy and sugar and all the things that they do. And she was she actually was Aunt Eula was Aunt Bess's sister and my mother's uh, uncle Barry Stevens. That was her uncle, and he would come a lot and stay at our hotel. He was a bartender. He'd have good times and bad times, and if times weren't so good, he'd come work for my dad. And he'd get rid of a lot of things. They had a lot of pretty uh, 
lawn furniture and stuff that you'd never buy when you live here at Innsdale. So I remember one time we had a table with a big umbrella on it, and, and he was quite a jokester, you know. He was quite a fun guy, and he liked to fish. I can remember that. But uh, uh, Aunt Bess was a beauty operator, so sometimes I she had a little beauty shop here too. So. She was the sister of Ben C. and Eula Gosh. We didn't have any relatives. And you know, if we were related to somebody, nobody ever said it. I didn't know that you know, a lot of people, like the Duncans had nine girls or something, you know. Everybody had aunts and uncles and cousins, and I didn't think we had any. They had some and didn't know they were related. <laughs> Just by marriage, but uh, isn't that funny? I didn't even know it.